And thank you once again for joining me on Autism Live UK Chat Show. We have a great show coming up for you again today. We're talking all things autism and also dyslexia, which is quite an interesting subject for me. So I'd like to join with me now Andrew Andrew Vassi. I hope I've got that right, Andrew. So Easy. Easy. Can you tell me about that? Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Um, I'm a study skills tutor um, and also an assistive technology trainer for students within the university sector. So I provide one-to-one support um, for students um, who access their support through the Disabled Students Allowance. Um, And I would also associate with being neurodiverse. And furthermore, I'm also on the executive um, for ADSHI, which is the Association of Dyslexia Specialists in Higher Education. Okay, so just tell me a little bit about your, how you first started, well, not how you first started, but how you got diagnosed with autism. Um, in terms of my diagnosis, well, I've been diagnosed with a number of disabilities, so, so the executive, um, and... Um, in terms of my diagnosis, I was diagnosed um, with dys- dyspraxia initially back in 2002, um, and then I was diagnosed with what was then called uh, Asperger's back in 2009, um, and then I had a diagnosis of dyslexia and also um, dysgraphia in 2013. Wow, wow so... that, that, that was a lot to take in there, Andrew. So, if, if you can yeah. just if you can just break us that break us that down one by one the conditions. And just explain mm-hmm. for us to viewers who may be listening now who probably don't know what all these conditions mean. So could you just break them down and just go through them conditions again? Okay, so first of all, um, with dyspraxia, so dyspraxia predominantly affects coordination, hence um, I have to drive an automatic car. It can also affect spatial awareness um, and also in terms of difficulties with physical coordination as yeah, as it's as implied. Um, in terms of uh, dysgraphia, so this is specifically to do with the legibility of my handwriting. Um, I suspect some of the people on Facebook, my um, school teachers, because some of them are following me, it's <laughs> hardly years on. They it's something that they would recognise from when they used to teach me years ago. Um, in terms of uh, Asperger, so it's in inter- uh, predominantly to do with um, sort of literal interpretation, um, obsessional interests, and um, also what will be seen as a difference in imagination. Um, and one of the things that I've been researching, because I'm also involved with research uh, on an MA in autism at London South Bank University, is I'm noticing that there is becoming more and more people who are diagnosed um, <coughs> uh, with on the spectrum. And also, the spectrum can cover a range from, from severity to very mild or, or so-called high functioning. In terms of um, with dyslexia, um, it I would say for myself, um, um, the spelling has been an, I- an issue. Um, but I, I do use a lot of software like Text Help and also Global Autocorrect. Um, and also in terms of needing to read things more than once. However, I would say in terms of the effects, uh, my dis- the effects of my dyslexia and dyspraxia are actually quite minimal because I'm very proficient. I'm trained specifically to work with adults on with dyslexia and dyspraxia. Okay, so the new the new one, I, I've not come across this condition before. Dis, can you just pronounce that again? Dis, dis, dysgraphia. Yeah, dysgraphia. Yeah, it's it's been around for a few years, but in terms of like for the DSM, the Diagnostic of Statistics of Manuals of Policies and Procedure, um, under version five, they are starting to use the term specific learning difference. So you may have seen someone before who has been diagnosed with that. This is post 2013, um, but then also people are originally diagnosed with dyspraxia which has been known about for a while, but um, Doctor, sorry, Professor Amanda Kirby, as she now is, who's a medical doctor and also a, a disability practitioner. Mm-hmm. Um, and she has been campaigning to raise awareness, but she was one of the first people who kind of got dyspraxia kind of out there alongside Mary Colley, who unfortunately died eight years ago, but I used to do some work for her as a um, sort of trustee of DANDA, the Developmental Adult Neurodiversity Association. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but in terms of um, people being diagnosed with dys dysgraphia, it's some it's becoming a bit more common. But the predominant issue is that because we are using more and more technology now, um, the effect of handwriting can have an effect for many people. Um, so it's not always so easy to pick up. Whereas on the ha other hand, compared to if someone is struggling with reading um, and in terms of auditory processing, things like that, then um, the dyslexia will be easy to pick up. Um, you know, there are some people who I'm friends with who are assessors who would would be able to point out the specific things that they look out for with dysgraphia, but it's not. It's okay, not okay. So can you, can you just spell me that con condition again? So it's D. Can you spell it for me? Yeah. So D Y S G. Yeah. R A. Yeah. P H. Yeah. I A. Right. Okay. So we're going to put that up on the screen now. So that's on the screen now. So if people watching this now, uh, we've actually got that word up there because I've not come across that before. So it's quite interesting. Uh, I've not come across that condition before. So can people have uh, obviously the comorbid condition? So can can people have the dyslexia, the dyscalculia, and the dys dysgraphia as well? Yeah, increasingly, and in, you know, within higher education, I'm coming across more and more people diagnosed with with multiple conditions. I mean, it's I, I've noticed specifically through my research. Um, I mean, I completed my PG and autism through the New School of Counseling and Psychotherapy. But I'd, since then, I've noticed there's always been the traits with dyspraxia and um, autism Asperger's because there's a 50 percent overlap um, in terms of those two. But with um, the dyscalculia, it's, it's becoming it's becoming more of an awareness. Mm -hmm. um, but I have worked with a student who had this calculator who was actually studying maths, which is interesting because he was determined not to let his condition affect him. Um, so for him, God, it was seven years ago. <laughs> um, I remember that he would find the more complex. So, for example, like the simultaneous equations, um, Pythagoras' theorem, things like that easier than the standard like everyday arithmetic so you go into tesco's you know you bought um milk and a loaf of bread it's one pound mm -hmm. fifty you've given them five pounds to, in cash you get three pound fifty back but it's it is it's, that's on a simplistic terms but in terms of the dyscalculia um that is now becoming part of training uh, because we are looking at sort of the model of neurodiversity. Um, and as I'm, I'm a member on the executive for, for ADSHA, which is the Association of Dyslexia Specialists in Higher Education, we, we are actively looking into running a new course. Um, I can't say too much at the moment, but we are, we are going to be offering a course in the near future. Okay, so training. so for an example, for, 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 for example, take for instance me, I've got autism. Yep. And mm -hmm. I've always thought I've got some form of dyslexia mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes I get my uh, words mixed up or back, back, mm -hmm. to, th back to front or, yeah. you know, I may be writing something and, mm -hmm. you know, it may, you know, I may, I may type something out on the keyboard or a text message and I'll, yeah. I'll look at it and think, well, is that a spelling mistake or, you know, it's not that I've got my words backed up. Sometimes the, the, the letters can be jumbled up. So, yeah. if, so if I wanted to get a diagnosis for dyslexia, because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm 44 now, mm -hmm. how, how would I go about that? Well, in terms of diagnosis, there's a, there's a variety of different processes. So within, um, within education, uh, if you were a student, and I, I do have some mature students in their 50s and even previously student in their 60s, they can get an assessment through a tutor assessor. So those would be people who've got the postgraduate diploma in assessment for specific learning difficulties, or what was the formerly OCR um, diploma from the, um, yeah, from, from OCR. Um, in terms of 
um, what will happen is the student may initially to undertake what is called a screening. So they'll go through a piece of software called LADS, which is the Luce's Adults Dyslexia Diagnostic CD-ROM. So basically they go in front of the computer for about half an hour, 45 minutes, and they would go through some questions. When I was a disability officer um, back in 2013 to 2015, I used to go through and guide the students. So I'd be pointing at the screen, this is what you need to do, and explain to them that this is only an initial indicator if they have dyslexia or not. Um, colleges and universities use this before they refer on to either a full tutor assess for full tutor assessor diagnostics, um, or you will be referred to a full um, educational psychologist. So can um, so can anybody access that software, or do they need to be with or by a practitioner to complete that? Um, I mean, there are, there are some that are available online, uh, but I'm, I'm led to believe, uh, and from personal experience, the LAD software is the best. But normally, you know, one can only normally get it uh, um, through, um, access it through, rather, through, through the university or college, um, as they tend to buy in bulk. Um, it's not a mass market product that I'm aware of at the moment. However, if someone was interested, then if they contact either ACHI or um, go to PATOS, the Professional Association of Teachers of Students with Specific Learning Difficulties, a mouthful, P-A-T-O-S-S, -S, which are based um, up north near uh, Malvern, um, which I'm not, yeah, so M-A-L-V-E-R-N, they will be able to refer you on to someone for an initial um, discussion. Um, obviously, with, with the actually standards, because we will have to be quality assured practitioners, so have our licenses renewed every year, mm -hmm. what we would have to do is they would have to go through a series of questions and also um, to make you aware, of, there, there is a financial implication. A full, a full diagnostic as an adult will range somewhere between 300 and 1,000 pounds, depending upon um, area and um, experience of the person undertaking the, the assessment. Um, I mean, I personally would recommend to get tested. Um, Obviously, if you were, um, so what would then, that, what, 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 <coughs> Sorry, Andrew. What would happen if somebody, uh, let's say, for example, they weren't at college or university, and they mm -hmm. thought they may be dyslexic? What, how, what would they need to do? If they, if they weren't in within the education setting, then they would initially need to either go to. Um, the British Dyslexia Association's website, um, the sort of BDA, they are, they are very well known because um, they provide advice generally, so in the public domain, um, or, you know, to go um, through access to work potentially, um, if they have another disability, so if, if they have dyspraxia, it might, it would be worth getting an assessment for dyslexia, or there's, there is the overlap. Um, I mean, outside of education, it can be variable. If, if the HR department in, within uh, a particular employer is very knowledgeable, and also there is a legal obligation, the Equality Act 2010, then an employer could refer on. Um, within education, it's a lot more sort of straightforward. You would go to the either inclusion and learning support or disability department, depending on the name within the college or university. It's a lot more straightforward because um, main sort of main um, lectures are subject lectures. So a lecturer in maths can refer you on to the learning support department or the college would uh, um, kind of signpost people and it's a referral process. It's quite sort of straightforward. There are a lot of policies and procedures within education. Outside, it it's it has been variable. People have access, especially support, from uh, one of um, my colleagues on the ACHI list, which there are now about 800 members, um, but it is more complex. So can people go to the GP and get a referral or does it need to go through a, pri through a private channel? Well, I mean, dyslexia is not a medical condition. So, I mean, and as such, um, I would recommend to go to contact the BDA, really, the British Dyslexia Association, because they provide general advice. Um, they do have a helpline, which is listed on their website. Um, or, you know, they, it might be worth going to the local library. Local libraries do tend to have information as well. Um, I mean, I know around Surrey and also in... Um, in London as well, they do. Um, so, I mean, or, or, or if they were contacting, say, like the mm. the job centre, they may have some information. Um, 
But in terms of the first point of call, I would say BDA. I've been, I have been a member in the past, so I know kind of what they sort of said through. Okay, so what, uh, so yeah. what, what, what would happen if a, a parent is watching this now and a, they think their child may be dyslexic? What, what would they need to do? If they were um, in the primary school, um, then they would either need to contact the SENCO, the Special Educational Needs Coordinator, or initially contact the, the school, um, their, um, their child's teacher, basically. Um, you know, identify where they, from their perspective, where that there are issues. So, for example, if the, the child is struggling with reading, or if they're getting headaches, because quite often people who have dyslexia experience visual stress. So, for example, working from a white background is not suitable for many dyslexics. Or if they're finding reading certain books, and, and unfortunately, even at, at university, you know, there's some books producing Times New Roman. Times New Roman is not a serif font. So, if they're noticing the real difference of the ability to read on a specific font then they should make that initial query um, some schools do have like um, um, like learning support teachers in them others don't um, you know depending upon the borough um, if they don't have much luck with the school hopefully they would then obviously they could contact the local council um, I mean fortunately here in Surrey um, where I live we do have like a, a, um, a specialist service for people with disabilities in terms of um, they have like a, a day center there's a point of contact within the council we have also a disability register um, I mean secondary schools they have a similar system secondary schools tend to attract more funding so for some bizarre reason that's that seems to be the case i've noticed okay. um so am i um, right in saying this is there are different forms of dyslexia well I mean, in terms of the effects then there, there are different effects in terms of um with dyspraxia there are um what would be called like verbal dyspraxia in terms of the pronunciation and the speech aspect whereas the other side would be more sort of the written aspect so in terms of the legibility of handwriting coordinations issues um and also perception so in terms of yeah i mean overall um i mean dyslexia in a way is similar to autism in that it is a spectrum and the effect i mean dyslexia can to more or less of a degree be overcome whereas obviously autism can't so, for example, with specialist intervention and tuition, I could teach a student how to become an independent learner um, and learn how to use compensatory strategies like using text to help or clarity for proofreading. Um, whereas with the effects of autism, for some people, they can learn how to manage through mentoring and also to, to reach out to get support when they need it. Um, but in terms of dyslexia, yeah, dyslexia can be, the effect can be more minimized. So... Uh, obviously, the sooner someone is diagnosed, the better. Entering higher education... So what would you say the earliest age is to be diagnosed with dyslexia? I mean, I know a lot of people in primary school in year one, so about five. Okay. So um, in terms of in higher education, I, be, I was teaching a, a student who was diagnosed whilst on their doctorate. So they'd been through, they've done their BA and, the, and an MA, and then they were really, really struggling. Um... It was the fact that they'd moved area, they'd got a scholarship to do their doctorate and um, some friends had been helped supporting them whilst they were on their previous courses, but then they were on their own. Um, and, and so in terms of getting the diagnosis then, there's a lot of sort of emotional issues and it's quite pressured because if you're doing a PhD, it's intensive studies, so long sort of essays, theses, that kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, but if someone does get diagnosed with their university, they do accept a lot of support. So the DSA, although there are cutbacks nationally um, in terms of the funding available, it it is good. Students can get access to a laptop with software, one-to-one -one support, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I mean, but if you are entering higher education, the report needs to be done after your 16th birthday. Okay. That's in accordance with the DFES 2005 guidelines. Um, so, so if people I, are watching this now, where, where can they access more information around uh, the conditions you've mentioned tonight, and especially with dyslexia? So what sort of websites and resources are available out there? 
Um, I mean, actually, uh, we do have a lot of information online, although it's predominantly about higher education. So if you go to ADSHI, so A-D-S-H dot O-R-G dot U-K, um, the dyslexia, found, um, sorry, the dyslexia, um, dyslexia action is, is useful, and also the British Dyslexia Association. Okay. Um, in terms of dyspraxia, is Dyspraxia Foundation's website. Obviously, for autism, there is a range of sources. I mean, Autistica um, are actively searching out at the moment for research participants. So if anyone is interested, um, they do send a lot of emails through, which you can join up o online. Um, with dysgraphia, um, I mean, the, there isn't a separate website that I'm aware of, so it would be referred to on the PATOS website, which is P-A-T-O-S-S, -S, which is the Professional Association of, of Teachers of Students with Specific Learning Difficulties. And I apologise that some of these, I didn't invent them, they are a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so with the, with the, dis, uh, the, the dis, uh, dyspraxia, how was the yep. dyspraxia picked up an error? How was that diagnosed? It depends on the age and also and depends on the type of suspected dyspraxia. So, so, in terms so of is it, there different types of dyspraxia? Yeah, so you have verbal dyspraxia and then the what I would call like more of the academic side and where there's the overlap with dyslexia. So in terms of the um, coordination, in terms of the difficulties with art and um, with, within PE, in terms of organization, per perceptual organization. So in terms of navigating through Bella Shapira, unfortunately she's no longer with us, um, was an excellent perceptual organization therapist. So this can help the dyspraxic person to, to understand and navigate their way through. Um, it's something that I would recommend. I mean, Mozi blocks are quite pom popular now. That's M O Z I blocks, um, which are available, um, you know, online um, quite cheaply, about under a tenner now. Um, they've come down over the years. When I first bought a a, a, a lot set, rather about five years ago, they were about twenty pounds. So because just become so, just explain what they are and um, what what they do. So in terms of a Mosey block, it's like a puzzle. So what it does is it helps you to kind of navigate around shapes and sort of generally kind of fit the, the, the bigger picture. So if someone with dyspraxia might have issues in terms of joining everything up. Um, or they might find a bit like in the way if you're on the autism spectrum, you may find like a sensory overload. Or if you're going into a big shop and you're a bit, get a bit sort of lost. Mm -hmm. um, and I know some universities that are, because they're older, for example, that can be difficult to navigate. So in terms of if you go through multi blocks and have you know a bit of th therapy, it can help. Um, and also kind of address kind of like mindfulness a bit of like meditation. Tai Chi sometimes refer referred to as a recommendation, but not for DSA funding. And I know one or two of my students have taken that up. It's not something that I have myself um, done, but I, I know some students who have, and they've kind of helped in terms of um, dealing with the effect. Okay, so what what does the actual what does the actual Tai Chi do then to the to 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 Al? It helps in terms of like getting someone to be aware of of, of one's body and also one's emotions, um, in terms of helping <laughs> organisations and also consciousness and the subconsciousness. And sometimes people learn better through um, subconscious. Um, I mean, this is something that has been discussed. Um, I, I forget the name of the book from the top of my head, but there are theories um, in the higher education PG cert, which I, I completed five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so where we were looking at theories of how people learn. And sometimes people say, for example, will pick up on things that if they're not necessarily intending to. So for example, um, and, and retain that information. So, for example, earlier in today's Metro, um, I noticed that they were looking for research participants um, aged between 21 and 55 um, uh, in uh, um, Kensington, Chelsea area to take part in some research into neurodiversity, <laughs> ironically. Um, but I learned that subconsciously, whereas if I was reading an article for my MA, um, I would have to go through the sort of standard academic process. And sometimes if you're interested, if you've got like a special interest or obsession, um, then people tend to find that more interesting to learn about. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, learning about new software, 
um, I would always find quite interesting. Okay. Well, Andrew, it's been a great insight uh, to, okay. have you, to have you on the show and uh, mm -hmm. to share all these conditions and what you do. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, That's okay. So, Andrew, thank you for joining me on the show today. And uh, mm -hmm. on tomorrow's show, I've got a show on tomorrow uh, on midday. I'll be talking to the Minister Caroline Denage about all things autism. So do join me for that show. That's at midday tomorrow. Until then, thank you.